Thanks, everybody. Uh, so here's what we're going to talk about. Um, basically, I wanted to go about uh, fintech uh, financial um, technological entrepreneurship and innovation overall. Uh, and then I would like to introduce two case studies, two real life stories that have uh, come from basically nothing and they made themselves uh, up for, um, from two different, very different uh, uh, lines of life, let's say. Um, and I have a surprise for you in the end, if you bear with me until the end. It's a little surprise, but it's still a surprise. And okay, so here we go. Uh, first, I'll introduce some numbers. Uh, as per 2022, 633 startups raised $3.3 billion in Africa, okay? That is a big, big number, 3.3 billion. Um, if you look at it in terms of uh, time, in seven years, the number of uh, funding that went to African tech startups increased by uh, tenfold, about a thousand percent. I mean, if you just look at the size of the lowest uh, black uh, block and the highest yellow block, you can see the difference. It's considerable, the amount of increase in the funding going to African tech startups. As per countries, uh, most of the funding uh, went to Nigeria and Egypt and Kenya, South Africa, Ghana, and Tunisia. So, um, but the most interesting thing over here is fintech, which I'm going to give some examples because it doesn't really mean much when you say fintech, finance, technology, when you bring it to how does that work? But when I give examples, that's going to make some uh, more sense. But at the moment, fintech, whatever it is, is uh, more than all the rest, all the other sectors, e-commerce, health, logistics, education, energy, whatever. Fintech is coming big time, okay? So what, what is this Fintech? Well, maybe you've heard of Flutterwave. Flutterwave uh, talks about global money transfers. Uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Tether, these are, um, you know, stuff that we don't do with real cash, but generated uh, cash, let's say. Um, borrowing, lending money, we have three startups, Branch, Tala, OneFi, working on this kind of thing. And uh, in order to bypass banks and all the commissions paid to banks while transferring money, we have three startups, Paga, for Yoko, for that, and insurance services. So anything related to finance, when brought together with an app or a technology, which has to do uh, with uh, internet and communication technologies is basically uh, making a lot of money. And that's what FinTech is. As far as the amount of money that they have received, Flutterwave uh, got 250 million, Move got 181 million. I'm not gonna go over every single number here, but these are, significant numbers. And uh, the first three is from FinTech. Uh, Yasir is from Algeria. And I checked out what the super app stuff is because I never heard about that before. And it's something like uniting uh, transportation with money transfer-ish kind of thing. Uh, it's a different thing. And it uh, basically addresses the French speaking um, part of the continent. And then we have, you know, retail, AI, e-commerce, and Amcopa pay as you go solar app. So these are uh, new, and they were able to secure all these sums. Now, I want you to please read this.
she's not just a regular person. She's the dean of a business school in Lagos, right? And she, what she's saying is, if you come up with any kind of app that's going to address the financial problems of a certain sector, you know, even a bus driver, imagine, just go check out the life of a bus driver, find out his problems. And if you're coming from a financial sector, then you can translate a solution to his problems with the app that you have. And there you're going to have a boosting business. She's promising it. Um, but if you are not coming from finance, like myself, I'm not coming from finance. Is there any way we can actually um, find some room for uh, starting a business or making money here? Um, for that, I'm going to share two real life stories of people uh, starting from scratch. So it's, it is very, very possible to start from scratch, but what kind of things should you be doing? What kind of steps should you be taking or what you should not be doing? This is what I need you to pay attention to. This is Anat Apter in 1991 when she was the mother of three. Her husband came up to her and said, we're bankrupt. And why for once don't you find a solution, he said. And she took this as a challenge. And uh, she was coming from a family uh, of um, falafel producing and selling. And this is her grandfather in the left. And that's her father at the counter when he was nine. So basically, uh, her she she knew how to make good falafel and she didn't want to do it because she had some bad memories in her family selling falafel making falafel so she was kind of staying away from it but she remembered her mother saying whenever you need money make and sell falafel you'll never go hungry so she listened to her mother and uh, her husband said, I can get you a trailer for $30. A friend of his had this old trailer sitting in his yard and $30, imagine, 30 US dollars. They didn't have that cash. He said, we're going to pay $30 in six months in installments, so it's $5 a month. And they, of course, okay, you have that, your trailer, where are you going to put the trailer? She used to be a, a frequent visitor of the flea market. By the, by the way, this is happening in um, South Africa, Bruma, exactly, there's a flea market there. And she used to just roam around because it was very cheap in the free market. And uh, when she wanted to open her falafel place, she went over to the managers of the market and there was a queue, a long queue. So she said, I don't want to wait this queue just to get some papers to apply for a place. So she just yelled out to the people, do you guys want to have a falafel place over here? And the administrator said, let her in. So the whole queue, you know, just opened up and she went to the administrator, she got the papers and she was able to get her space. In two weeks time, they said, come back with the papers and you'll have your place. So that's how she secured the place. And her husband helped her with the trailer. Remember, $30 to be paid back in six months, $5 a month. But she didn't have the cash to buy the ingredients, you know, to make the falafel. And they went to the bank, again, no cash. And they asked if they could use their credit card limit to the max, which was $550. And the bank said, fine. 
because they was they were launching a business. So that's how she started her business. And uh, after a while, the, the, the first day she had this, uh, as you see that waist bag, she, she says how it felt so good when cash was filling up her bag in the, in the waist. And after a while, her husband wanted to support her and he said, we can make this bigger. And um, he went to uh, a place in the mall uh, to another donut shop. And he went to ask to the owner of the donut shop, you have such a big place over here. Why don't we share the rent? Why don't you let us be uh, our uh, falafel place? in your shop so that we can share the rent and we can make some money while paying you half the rent. And of course, uh, the donut guy, I mean, didn't know them at first. So he had to come to the flea market to check out what kind of business they were doing, how they were doing, whether they were doing enough money. And uh, when he was convinced, then there was another burden, which was to convince the owner of the mall, the manager of the mall, not the owner, but the manager. And uh, thankfully, the manager was a visitor, was a customer of Anna's at the flea market. So she knew how good the fellow felt was. So she approved of her coming into the mm, uh, coming into the mall. And uh, they opened up this place, but they didn't have any money again. So even the chef had to work painting the walls, bringing the cabinets. And they actually did this with their employees, like Anat and her husband. They had to rely on their manpower in order to uh, decorate the place. And they couldn't really. Um, make much money there until 1995, basically, 94 or 95, yeah, something like that, until they opened up another place in Eastgate. Uh, they, they somehow couldn't make enough money. But in the Eastgate, when they started with shawarma, which is another Middle Eastern dish, they started making a lot of money. So, uh, then their second place started booming in business. So uh, if we just go back to her story, what she suggests is do what you know best. If you stick with the stuff that you know of, which is in her case, it was falafel. Um, and if you stick to good quality. She says, fresh falafel is what you need. If you just wait and use old material, it's not gonna taste good. So you have to do it fresh every single day. And if I don't like the taste of it, she says, I won't serve it to my customers. So customer is essential, but cash is secondary. So you can actually start weaving your business with a minimum amount of cash, but then as long as you have customers sticking with you, backing you up, believing in your product, then cash will come. That's her story. Now I have, a, I have another one, and this is from starting with Kenya. Steve Mululu is a local Kenyan. Um, he, was born to a family of 60 siblings uh, in West Kenya. He, he said he had to compete for food and shelter, basically. He, if he was late one minute for uh, food, for meal, then food might be finished. Or if he was late for bed, then he might have to sleep Maybe, I don't know, not under the roof somewhere. So he said, 
his father read only one verse from the Bible, multiply. He had four wives and um, he didn't believe in schooling the kids because he was a farmer and he needed people to work in the farm. That's why he didn't send his kids to school. But the life standards uh, were extremely difficult. And Steve Mulu says, I was determined not to live like this forever. Okay, this is where I'm born and these are my conditions and I didn't get any schooling. But he, 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 had, a, he had a decision that he was not going to live like this for the rest of his life. So he says the city was very attractive. So he decided to take off when he was 16 years old and he went to the city. But there things were even harder, he says, because since he didn't have any schooling, he didn't have any marketable skills. Uh, but he had to do something. And uh, he started out by... Uh, going to this place where people were boxing things, packaging things. And when they handed him the overalls, he saw a guy who was stooped over. And he asked him how long he's been working in this place. And the guy said, 40 years, 40 years. He said, the minute he said 40 years, I saw my future right then and there. And I said, I don't want to be like this guy. And he gave the overalls back and he rejected that future. Then he had to rely on his strength because he didn't have any schooling. He didn't have any marketable skill, but he was physically very fit and he knew uh, he was strong. He was a hard worker and he started boxing. Boxing led him to uh, fitness centers. And at fitness centers, he started doing personal training for people. And in the meanwhile, he got uh, from Kenya, he came to South Africa where he didn't know anybody. He was basically starting from scratch. He didn't know anybody. He didn't have any cash. He was simply relying on his power, physical power, but, he says, he had spotted something. While doing that personal training, he saw how frustrated people were. And one thing he says is, wherever there's people, there's problems. And if you catch a problem, there is a business opportunity there. Perfect. So he said, if I can have my fitness center, then I can make people uh, enjoy training, not be frustrated by it. So that was what he had in his mind as a product. But he goes on, he finds this place, perfect place for, a, for his future fitness center. And he asks uh, the landlord if he would be willing to uh, lease it to him. And the landlord says no, because the landlord asks for three months cash upfront. And he doesn't have that kind of cash. Then he goes and um, looks at the equipment and the conditions are, uh, 50% down payment on order and 50% on delivery. He doesn't have that cash. No way. See, at that moment, I would give up. This is the difference between entrepreneurs and other people. When difficulties come up, most of the people say, well, I can't do this. Obviously, I don't have the cash. And I can't do it. How can you? How can anyone solve this kind of a problem? They're asking for cash. I don't have cash. Problem solved. 
Give it up. He doesn't. He doesn't give up. How can you solve a problem like this? This, this is very interesting. So he says, every time I went to the landlord, I was going with my uh, training outfit. And the landlord was looking at me and seeing a poor trainer with nothing, basically, just some dreams. When I was trying to convince the equipment vendor, I had to send an email to him for 12 weeks in a row and always on Tuesdays. Why Tuesdays? Because on Monday, everybody's inbox is full. And most of the time, people go through the important, the essential uh, emails and delete all the rest. So on Tuesdays, if I send this email, the guy will have a chance to check it out. So that was a strategy too. And his proposal to the vendor was South Africa is a reasonably large country and not even 10% is working out at the fitness center. So there's market here, not even 10%. But if you would use my facility as your showroom for your equipment, then we can have a deal because this part, this market is going to grow and people will open up who are willing to open up new centers will come and see your equipment in my place. So you're going to make money through me. This was his proposal. And after 12 weeks, one day he gets an email back. So he's not giving up for 12 weeks. He's sending an email to someone in the US and hoping that he will one day get a reply. And for, for the guy in the US, imagine you're getting an email from out of the blue. Somebody is sending an email. You might not take it seriously. Well, you might not take it seriously for once, for twice, but if it's coming 12 times in a row, eventually you will give up and say, okay, let me read what this guy is saying. And it makes sense, you know, not even 10%. So if I can get into this market in time, I will grow in this market. So there's numbers. And if the numbers are correct, then there's business opportunity here. So what happens is this. In the meanwhile, Steve goes and sits in front of this empty building and he visualizes people working out in this facility. So this is a technique entrepreneurs use, use. You see your dream come true and you feel it come true. How would it feel for you to see this place full of people, full of energy? How would you feel when, when, you, when you achieve that while it's empty? That's, that's the idea to act as if it has happened. And he was visualizing this um, Disneyland for adults. That's how he terms it. Uh, when people are having fun, working out, it's just like Disneyland for adults. And he, the guy comes from US and he accepts Mululu's offer. Mululu says, I need one favor from you. Will you come with me and pose as my business partner towards the landlord? And the guy accepts. Steve thinks like this. If this American guy acting as my business partner talks to the landlord with his American accent and his sales skills, he might convince him. And that's exactly what happens. 
Landlord says, okay, to this guy, and they start out. They make a deal. After that, Steve hires 20 guys with yellow shirts. And he sends them out. And these guys make the first 100 sales. At that point, he says, I was afraid, but I had received people's money. So I could not go back at that point. So we had to do this. And that's how he starts the business. Um, he calls it Dream Boy, Dream Buddy. And it's, it starts to be a, a, a good uh, business. So what he says is, you have to know your life standards. You have to make it up in your own head. What kind of a life do you want to live? Then you need to have a dream. In this case, his dream was a fitness center. And he was doing this because his only strength was the, was the physical strength. He was afraid of having a business. He, he never had any education, the proper education. He didn't know the right people, but he knew he was a good personal trainer and he knew the problem, which was frustration. And he says, where there's people, there are problems. Where there are problems, there are business opportunities. Now, the surprise here is I reached out to Steve Mululu. And I said, if um, Atlantic International University students would be willing to get in touch with you, would you be open to talk to them? And he said, sure, I'm open to talk to anybody. He said, I'm helping people out, I'm mentoring people. And I asked, did you get any mentoring yourself when you were doing this thing? Like, you didn't have much money or the network. He said, I had many mentors. My mentors were my customers. While we were working out, I was asking questions. Things that I wanted to learn from business people, I was asking for their opinions. And they were willing to give me all the information that I wanted. But he said he was reading listening, learning constantly. So uh, he's open to anybody to give any kind of advice or knowledge. And I'm a nobody from nowhere. I mean, I'm from Turkey. And I just said, uh, I sent him an email. I said, I'm going to uh, have a webinar uh, for this class. And I'm going to talk about uh, entrepreneurship and how to finance a business from nothing and that's something that you did would you be uh, willing to talk to me he could have said no I'm busy he didn't say that he said sure why not and we had a zoom so you guys can do the same just either phone or email or whatsapp whatever his information is out there it's public and it's not only for Steve, it, it could be for any, anybody you want to get in touch with, as long as you want to learn from these people. So um, if you want to start your own startup, and if you don't have any cash, then this is a good point to start with. This is a free course in Udacity, how to build a startup. This is not the only free course on the internet, but it's uh, something that you can get started with. Uh, but if you don't have the time, I would strongly suggest you take the time and invest in learning how to start a startup. And uh, there's a difference between incubators and accelerators. If you simply have an idea, then you might want to go for an incubator where they're going to give you an office space for free and they help you how you should build a prototype. Um, 
and a minimum viable product. See, there's certain jargon, certain terms you need to learn as an entrepreneur. And in order to choose the right incubator, you gotta be talking to the alumni of that incubator. Um, but the, once you start something and bring it to a certain level where you have some sales, then you might wanna apply to an accelerator where they're going to take whatever you have on hand and accelerate it. You're going to get training, you're going to get mentorship, networking with the industry experts, and you will pitch to the investors, which is a very specific skills. Um, I made some search as far as the top accelerators in Africa. I mean, there are a lot of accelerators in Africa. So you can go for um, any one of these, depending on where you are, or you can find one in your country and check out their alumni, what kind of benefits these accelerators are giving and pick your choice. These are the references. Um, and I'd like to thank you for listening to me.